some other books out there. And uh, he is specializing in the King James Bible uh, issue. It's no debate here at Franklin Road Baptist Church. However, I always think it's wise that for you to have bullets for your guns. And so uh, tonight, uh, he's here for that. He could probably spend a week and uh, never touch the surface of uh, the confusion. We're good Franklin Road Baptist Church. I appreciate it. Thanks. If we can bring the lights down. Listen, I want to tell you, I really appreciate being here. I have thoroughly enjoyed myself. My family um, has had a good time. You're a big church, and what I have found in a lot of large churches is, you know, you just don't get the handshakes. You don't get the, the closeness. Uh, I told somebody this morning I couldn't walk through that hall out there without being stopped three or four times and saying, Welcome, how are you doing? And, and and listen, that's, a, that's quite a testimony to Franklin Road Baptist Church, and we praise the Lord for that. Thank you. Uh, we have felt at home. Um, the issue that I'm dealing with uh, tonight, and which we travel uh, basically in the United States, we're gonna, we've got a couple of foreign countries that, um, I, I guess the one I told this morning, the Bahamas is a foreign country. We've got to go over there and preach in, in January. Um, <laughs> You know, it's this cold weather. You've got to do it at the right, during the right month. Um, but, you know, the issue with the King James Bible isn't a popular issue sometimes. And what I have found is that people have handled it very uh, caustically, uh, in a caustic way. And I try to handle it in such a way that I would want it presented to me if I wasn't real familiar with the issue. So I'm going to try to do that tonight. We're going to be dealing with one issue, and that is salvation. This is a book that we have out on the table. One book stands alone. I have two volumes. This one came out last week. This is the one that I'm going to be doing tonight. This is volume one, and this is volume two on Catholicism. That's what I did this morning in Sunday school. Now, what happened was I was writing another book, and some people asked me, actually, my pastor asked me, he said, look, would you just write some booklets so that we have something very simple, concise, that we can give away and give to people? So that's what I did. I, I stopped writing the full book and started writing chapters. And this basically would cover a chapter in, in my new book. Uh, the presentation I'll do tonight follows along, you know, pretty much along with it. But do pray as we go on and we look at the issue of salvation. One book stands alone. Um, I always start out with this verse in Psalm 12, verses 6 and 7. The Bible says, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Now that's the King James Bible. I've got KJB up there in parentheses. Now here's the NIV, Psalm 12, 6. And the words of the Lord are flawless, like silver refined in a furnace of clay, purified seven times. O oh Lord, you will keep us safe and protect us from such people forever. Now, I always stop there, and if I'm teaching in the, you know, young people or something, I'll ask them, you know, is that the same thing? And they'll say, no, it's all messed up. You know, and it is. It doesn't say the same thing. And that's the first thing we need to realize about the modern translations. They do not say the same thing. It's not just an updating of the English language. They'll, they'll say that that's what it is. But there's 150 different copyrighted versions on the market. In order to get a copyright, you have to have enough changes in it to qualify for a copyright. How do you get 150 different copyrights? You have to have enough changes. That means that the NIV can't say the same thing as the New American Standard, which can't say the same thing as the Living Bible, of course paraphrased, which can't say the same thing as the, you know, today's English version or the Revised Standard Version or the Revised Version. They all have to say something different in order to qualify for a copyright. The thing we're going to see is they don't, not only don't say the same thing, but there's a satanic influence behind it. As we looked at the 12 things on Roman Catholicism in Sunday School this morning, it became very evident to many people that came and talked to me and said, I never knew that it was like that. I didn't realize how significant these changes were. When we look at salvation, we'll see the same problem. We'll see the same uh, issue dealt with, and that is that Satan is behind this thing. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, I do thank you for your many blessings. I pray, Lord, that you'd give me the words to preach. Help me to say only that which you'd have said. 
nothing more, nothing less. In Jesus' name and for His sake, amen. As we look, the King James Bible versus the modern versions concerning salvation. Christ came to save the lost. Or did He? In Luke 9.55, the King James Bible says, But He turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit you are of, for the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. The Bible clearly says that the Lord did not come to destroy men's lives, but instead He came to save them. The NIV says, But Jesus turned and rebuked them, and they went to another village. Now, if you remember, those of you that were in there this morning, this also dealt from a Catholic perspective. You know, in other words, they said, Do we, can we bring down fire like Elijah did and, you know, burn them all up? That's all out of there, too. But the point that we're trying to look at here is that Jesus is making uh, the statement, the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Now, here's another verse, Matthew 18, 11, For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. Twenty years ago... Somebody told me that. Twenty years ago, somebody showed me that Jesus came and died for my sins and I accepted Him as my personal Savior. Twenty years ago. And since then, I decided, and, and, and with the Lord's help, I was going to serve Him and live for Him all my days. What does the NIV say? If you look for verse 11 in the NIV, you won't find it. I have a copy of an NIV right here, and I'll deal with this later on. This is the Teen Study Bible, New International Version. And I'll show you some clips out of it, some pages actually out of this book. But if you look up Matthew 18, 11 in here, what you'll find is there's Matthew 18, 10 and 18, 12, and there is no verse 11. I actually have a list of the verses in here um, on page 4. Down at the very bottom, I have a list of many of the verses that are missing. We're going to deal with one more later on that deals with a salvation issue in Acts chapter 8. And I'll show you that when we get to it. In John 6, 47, dealing with salvation, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. The object of our belief is to be the Lord Jesus Christ. We're to believe on Him. You can't just believe what you want. You can't believe and say, Well, I believe in Hinduism. I believe in Muhammad. I believe... No. He said, He that believeth on me... What does the NIV say? I tell you the truth, he who believes has everlasting life. The object of your belief is to be on the Lord Jesus Christ, and that is missing in the modern translation. We need to realize that it gets worse than this. In Mark 10, 24, And the disciples were astonished at his words, but Jesus answereth again and saith unto them, Children, how hard it is for them that trust in riches to enter in the kingdom of God. I think one of the hardest people to deal with sometimes are those that are trusting in riches. But if you trust in anything apart from the Lord Jesus Christ, you're not going to be saved. You can't trust in riches. You can't trust in fame. You can't trust in Hollywood. You can't trust in uh, Washington. You're not going to be saved. Here the warning is, those that trust in riches, how hard it is for them to enter the kingdom of God. The warning is given against trusting in riches. What the NIV does is make salvation difficult. Mark 10, 24, and the disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. You see, the warning is no longer there about trusting in riches. The warning that each and every person needs to hear about trusting in riches. If you trust in riches or anything else, you cannot be saved if that's what you think will get you to heaven. In Ephesians 1.13, the Bible says, "...in whom ye also trusted, after ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance to the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of His glory." So what does it say? "...in whom ye also trusted..." When did you trust in Jesus? After you heard the word of truth? Which is what? The Word of God. The Word of Truth. The Gospel of Salvation. And then it goes on and says, In whom also, after you believed, what happened to you? You were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. After you believed, you're sealed until the day of redemption, according to Ephesians chapter 4. This is where we start getting really thick into this salvation thing. Ephesians 1.13 in the NIV. 
And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth. There is nobody included in Christ simply by hearing. You have church members every day across this country that come forward and get saved. I remember I had a deacon's wife that came forward a couple of years back. She had been in that church 35 years and she got saved. She didn't get saved just because she sat in the pew and listened to the word. I saw her come forward and I remember looking and I didn't know what, what was going on. And she came forward and she says, I'm here to get saved. She says, I'm tired of playing. It says in the NIV, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth. The gospel of your salvation. No, you can't just hear, you have to believe. You must trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, as you look at the verse and you keep going, it says, having believed, you were marked in him with a seal. What is the most popular translation on the market today? It's the NIV. There are people that are picking this up and they're using it. And they're saying, this is my Bible of choice. What happens if the rapture happens? There's going to be churches that are filled with people that are lost. I believe the churches will continue on and the preachers, if they're still there or somebody else takes over, they're going to take over and they're going to say, look at what the Bible says. The Bible says all Christians are marked. Isn't that what the NIV says? The NIV says, having believed, you were marked in Him with a seal. You're marked. Christians don't have a mark. We have the Spirit of God living in us, but we're not marked. Acts 8, 36, look at what it says. The Ethiopian eunuch, verse 36 says, And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, see here, see, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Now, if somebody came up to you and they said, Hey, what's stopping me from being baptized? How come I can't join your church? And you look at them and you say, <clears throat> Well, you've got to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Have you ever trusted in Christ? Have you ever believed on Jesus? That's the question, right? Well, he asked the question, what's hindering me to be baptized? Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he, went, and he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. The question about baptism, the guy acknowledges that he got saved, he confesses the Lord Jesus Christ, and then he's baptized. And that's the way it's supposed to work. The NIV. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? He gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down in the water, and Philip baptized him. No salvation. The Church of Christ teaches that you must get baptized in order to be saved. They use Acts 2.38, Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. You see, we've got to realize that this attack is a satanic attack. It gets worse. It's works salvation in the modern translation. Well, here's another one before we get to that. 1 Corinthians 15, 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. This is the Apostle Paul. He declares unto us the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. In other words, they never believed the truth. They never trusted in Christ. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. Here's the gospel. How that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scripture, that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day, according to the I do, like I mentioned in Sunday school, I do a lot of the comparisons myself. And this is one of the ones, it was one word, the word how. See it in red up there? It says that Christ died, that he rose again. I'm sorry, that he was buried, that he rose again. But that's not the gospel. If somebody says, what's the gospel? You can say the death, burial, and resurrection. Don't get me wrong. But if you technically want to answer them in a doctrinal way, it says how that Christ died is part of the gospel. What does that mean? Well, when you think about how Christ died, what does that include? The shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The fact that He died on the cross of Calvary. The fact that He became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteous of God in Him. 
You see, when you, when you look at that one word, and that one word is included in the gospel, how that Christ died, as a part of the gospel, that includes the blood, the cross, the fact that He's God. It was, it was God shed blood, Acts 20, 28. God shed His blood for our sins. Let me show you why that's important. Well, let me show you, first of all, what the NIV says. The NIV leaves out that word how. How is no longer in there. There are people today that claim that, it, that Jesus dying on the cross wasn't important. They say he could have drowned in, in, in the Sea of Galilee. I mean, they actually say that. They actually preach that. They actually believe that. When you have that one word, how, included in the gospel, it changes the whole meaning of the gospel, and that means that everything that Bible tells you about Jesus' death is part of that gospel. That's why you don't just tell them, hey, just believe Jesus died. Well, how about Jesus died for you? How about Jesus shed his blood, his precious blood for you? There are churches that are taking the blood out of the songbooks because it's already been taken out of their Bibles. John MacArthur is one of the most famous. He's from Grace Community Church in Sun Valley, California. He wrote this. He said it was his death that was efficacious, not his blood. The gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, 4 hits the issue Christ died. The shedding of blood has nothing to do with bleeding. Let me say it again. The shedding of blood has nothing to do with bleeding. I don't understand that. The shedding of blood has nothing to do with bleeding, he said. It simply means death. Violent, sacrificial death. Nothing in his human blood saves. That's the key, too. He said human blood. I may add a note on Revelation 1.5, a passage which is confusing in the King James Version. The word washed is not correct. The Greek word is delivered. It is not his bleeding that saved me, but his dying. That's what he said. Many people question him on that, so seven years later, when Moody Bible Institute published his commentary on the book of Hebrews, it says this in his commentary, It was not Jesus' physical blood that saves us, but his dying on our behalf, which is symbolized by the shedding of his physical blood. That's why you have Colossians 1.14 in your Bible. It says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Amen. It's through his blood. Well, the problem is if you have a modern translation. In whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. The blood's gone. Now remember, we're only dealing with one issue tonight. Uh, my favorite one actually is on the deity of Jesus Christ. I threw a little bit of that in this morning just because I couldn't, sometimes I just can't hold back. You know, I, I say, well, you know, I've got to do this and I've got to stick to one thing, but every now and then I just, I, I just can't do it. I've got to throw that stuff in there on the deity when, that, when, when the deity of Jesus Christ is attacked. But here the blood is attacked. Let me show you another issue with John MacArthur. He said it's human blood, right? Well, that didn't start with John MacArthur. It started in the first century. It says in 1 John 1, 7, But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth, cleanseth us from all sin. Jesus Christ. Christ is the anointed one. You see, it's, it's the blood of Jesus Christ. It's the blood of God. Acts 20, 28. What does the NIV say? But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, His Son, purifies us from all sin. You see, in the first century, Paul warned, and he said that there are many which corrupt the Word of God. In the first century. Now I want you to think about something. If Paul warned us that there were many which were corrupting the Word of God, don't you think that God knew all along what was going to happen? Sure He did. All the way back in the Garden of Eden. If He allowed Satan to say, Hath God said? The first question in the Bible, He could have stopped that. But you know what He has allowed? He has allowed man to question His Word. He's allowed Satan to have that influence in the thing to question his infallible, perfect word. Why? Because he's God. Because he's God. We can't figure it out. 
I'm going to show you some things toward the end about why you have to believe the Bible's perfect. The book that you have in your hands, you have to believe that book is perfect. I'm going to, pr I'm going to, try, to try to get you to doubt that for a moment. I'm going to show you two scriptures that seem to contradict. A Mormon showed them to me. After I'd been saved six months, he got me to doubt. Because that's the way Satan works. 1 Corinthians 1.18 works salvation. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. The preaching of the cross. It's the power of God. To those of us which are saved. Here's the NIV. For the message of the cross, no longer preaching. Preaching is diminished. Satan doesn't like preaching. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. That's a process. I, I know this. I'm not being saved. I are saved. Amen. You say, why would you say it that way? Because I just believe the book. It says are. I am saved. That's what the book says. But unto us which are saved is the power of God. First of all, you've got the attack on preaching. Satan hates preaching. He doesn't want, he doesn't want the preaching to go on. That's why so many churches, what they're turning to is modernized services. This bothers me a little bit that I have to use the computer and I have to do it through the, these means. But it's the most effective way. I used to use an overhead and, and I did the overhead for a while. And uh, I, was, I was preaching with uh, uh, Ken Hovind. He's out of Pensacola, and he does the, he's the dinosaur guy. He, I, he, uh, let me see, he went first, then I preached after him. He got up there, and he used one of these, pop, pop, pop. And you're just sitting there going, whoa. And then I get up there, and I'm with my little overhead, you know. And I go, well, you know, and he told me, he says, look, you need to get it. You need to get one. I said, yeah, $4,000. He said, you need to get one. He said, it'll, it'll change the way you do your presentation, and it does. Usually I move around a lot more, but, you know, with a video, I've got to sort of stay still. He gets me in and out of focus and all that stuff. 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteous of God in him. Interesting thing, when you look at John 1.14, you know the Bible says that all things were made by him, and nothing consists except through him. Everything's made by Jesus, even us in our righteousness, because we have his righteousness in its place. Look at what it says, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. As soon as you get saved, you're made righteous. If you're not saved today and you're in here and you can hear my voice, you're not righteous, and if you stand before a holy and perfect and just God, He can do nothing but give you the condemnation which you already have. That's waiting for the judge to say, you're gone. You see, there's a lot of people that don't understand that. We, according to John, it says that we're already condemned. All the lost person's waiting for is the day when God says, all right, here's the sentence, eternal separation. If you're not saved, you can be saved today and you can be made righteous just like that. Amen. Just trust in Jesus. Believe on Him and you can be saved. Here's the NIV. God made Him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. It's a process to them. It's not something that happens at the moment of salvation, but it's a process over a process of time. In Acts 15, 19... The Bible says, Wherefore my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God. Now, let me explain the background on this a little bit. What was happening was the Gentiles were getting saved and they had all these chiefs telling them what to do. You know, you need to keep the law, you need to you know, not eat this, and you need to you know, bring the sacrifice. You know, they were telling them all these things. So what happened was they all got together and said, look, these Gentiles that have turned to God, they've gotten saved, we need to write them a letter. This is what he wrote them. But that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. Why did he write that to them? Because they were still trying to reach the Jew. Remember Romans 1.16, which was applicable at the time, 
said it was to the Jew first and also to the Greek. At that time, during the first century, they were going to that Jew first and trying to present to them the gospel first. And because of that, they wanted to make sure that these Gentiles that got saved still had an effective ministry to the Jews, and therefore they told them, look, stay away from pollutions of idols and, and, and things strangled from the blood. Because if you don't do that, you won't be effective in the ministry to go to these Jews. Notice it's those that have turned to God. They're already saved. You don't tell any lost person how to live for God. I mean, do you, when you go and you knock on a door, hey, I'm from uh, Franklin Road Baptist Church. Just want to tell you, I uh, want to invite you to the services, find out if you have a home church. And let me ask you a question. Have you quit all the bad things you do? I mean, is that what you do? No. Let me tell you about Jesus. He died for you. See, and then they say, well, I, well, I'm saved. Well, then you deal with them about different issues. Then you might be able to minister to them and help them to grow up in the Lord. But look what the NIV says. It is my judgment, therefore, that, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. You don't tell anybody that's turning to God how to live for God. No, what happened according to the Word of God is it was those that had turned to God. Those were the ones that they were writing to. It's very dangerous to confuse those two issues, salvation and service. You have no service before salvation. All your righteousness is, plural, are as filthy rags. There's none good, no, not one. We've got to get them to realize there's nothing they can do to be justified before God except trusting in Jesus Christ. The modern translations confuse that. Here's 2 Corinthians 2.15, For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. The NIV for we are to God the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. There is nobody that is being saved. You have two extremes. God works in extremes, black and white, right and wrong. You have those that are saved and those that are lost. And that's it. There's nobody in between that is being saved as a process. Notice what else this teaches. The word we is in red. Do you know who wrote? 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul. That means when you include that thought in there, the guy that wrote more books of the Bible than anybody else, when you include the thought of who wrote this, and you read it with that in mind, but for we, including the Apostle Paul, are to God, the Rome of Christ, among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. He had no eternal security. According to the NIV, he didn't. According to the NIV, he's included in that group that is being saved. I don't know what happened to him on the road to Damascus then. In 2 Timothy 2.12, somebody will point to you in the King James Bible and say, see, here is losing your salvation in the King James Bible. That's why I included it in there to show that it's not. The Bible says if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. What does it mean? If we suffer, the Bible says all those that live godly in Christ Jesus shall do what? Suffer persecution. So here's the cross reference. All those, and that's, chat, that's uh, 2 Timothy 3.12. All those that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. If we suffer because we live godly, we shall also reign with Him. If we deny Him by not doing what? Suffering. He will also deny us a what? A reign. Look at it. If we suffer, we reign. If we deny him by not suffering, he denies us. Context, a reign. That's what it teaches. It doesn't teach that if you deny him, he'll deny you and send you to hell after you're saved. 2 Timothy 2.12 in the NIV, if we endure tribulation doctrine, no longer do you have the cross-reference abilities in the modern translation. It's no longer suffered. It's if we endure... We will also reign with him. If we disown him, he will also disown us. 
The NIV teaches that you can disown God and He'll disown you. Every modern translation teaches that. He'll disown you. He won't disown you. I've dealt with... I've been in mission work, uh, city mission, for 16 years. And I'm, I'm president of, of the mission, have been for a number of years. Don't get involved as much while I'm on the road. But I've dealt with, I don't know, literally hundreds, maybe even a couple thousand people that struggle with this thing on eternal security because they've done so much after they've gotten saved. And we try to deal with them and show them, look, God's not going to disown you. My, my Bible says. One of them will throw that up to you. Boy, it's disheartening. Then you've got to spend all that time getting that Bible out of their hand and getting the right one in there, which we try to do at the very beginning. We, we stand on it. I mean, they come in, you know, they've got to get rid of it and they've got to take ours, and they know. They know if they've been around missions much. Look at, look at what the NIV says. Let me read it to you again. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we disown him, he will also disown us. Next verse. If we are faithless, he will remain faithful, for he cannot disown himself. If we disown him, he'll disown us, but he can't disown himself. That makes sense, doesn't it? You see how confusing this is? And God's not the author of confusion. 1 Corinthians 14, 33. If we disown him, he'll disown us, but he cannot disown himself. Why? You're filled with the Spirit of God. You've got the Spirit of God in you. If you disown him, he'll disown you, but he can't disown himself because you're a child of God. What type of circular reasoning would it make to make, would you have to do to make sense of that? You can't make sense of it. Listen, there are contradictions all the way through these modern translations, and there's not one contra contradiction in the King James Bible. That's why I wrote this book. It deals with the difficult passages that are, that are said to be contradictory and shows how to teach them, and none of them contradict. You think James 2.24, you see then how that by works a man is justified, not by faith only? Not a problem. Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost? Not a problem. It's clearly in the Bible how to answer those things. All you have to do, study, rightly divide the word of truth. Here's one, 1 John 4, 2. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is in the world. So what does the Spirit have to do? It says try the spirits, right? Try the spirits. They've got to confess Jesus Christ. Let me show you what the NIV says. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ come in the flesh is from God. Didn't all the spirits, when they saw Jesus, say, you're the Son of God, you know, you come torment us before a time? Did they acknowledge Jesus? Sure, they knew who he was. Did they confess him? No. Let me give you a practical application. Here, here you've got a body, got a hole in the head, dead. And you look at that body, the police come in, you say, I acknowledge that's a dead body. I acknowledge that that person's been murdered. Or you say, I confess that that person's been murdered. And I confess I did it. You know, is there a difference? Sure there is. There's a difference between acknowledging and confessing. All the spirits acknowledge Jesus, but they don't confess him. How are you going to try the spirits if you don't know that truth? You won't know that truth unless you have the King James Bible. And again, remember, we're dealing with one issue here, salvation. Remember it says uh, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, that's not acknowledging. That's not simply acknowledging him. You've got to confess him. You've got to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't just acknowledge that he was a great prophet. All the religions seem to do that. You must confess. In Matthew chapter 7, at the end of this little booklet, just because I knew there would be people that would get this, and, and only this, and I, I don't have them out on the New King James yet, and may not put them in booklets. It may just be when I do the full book. I put one verse on the New King James just to show that it's, they're all the same. Here it is, and it says in Matthew 7, 13, a very familiar verse, Enter ye at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Narrow is the way, right? 
Here's the New King James Version. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many which go in by it, because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Making salvation difficult. They're all the same. Every modern translation on the market comes from corrupt Greek manuscripts. They come from the, the Westcott and Hort manuscripts. They were two corrupt men. Usually in, in the service that I do on Catholicism, I show that they, they were really Roman Catholic sympathizers. And, I, and, and in this booklet, I think it was well, chapter 2, in this booklet, I show in there and footnote 32 different times that they were heretical. And all your modern translations come about because of them. In the 1880s, they came out with their own Greek translation. And they snuck it into the committee that did the uh, English Revised Version and the American Standard Version of 1881 and 1901. And the, pe the people in there, most of them quit um, and, and left. As a matter of fact, the, the, there are some writings that say there was an 88% dropout rate on those that were on the original committee of the uh, revised, standard, uh, right, revised Version of 1881. Why did they quit? Because they saw the heresy that was coming. All modern translations have their roots from the 1880s. Every single one of them. Satan doesn't stop his attack on the, on the comparisons. That's all I did this morning. That's all I've done so far. I want to show you this teen study Bible. This teen study Bible is the New International Version. On the back of it, this is what it says. 20 full-color pages give a Christian perspective on contemporary issues. And in here, I'll show you, there's pages like this. And there's 20 pages. Okay? Let me show you some of the pages. Here's the one for church. Notice the question mark up there. It says, Presbyterian, Baptist, Pentecostal, Methodist, Lutheran, Church of Christ, Catholic, Assembly of God. Why are there so many different churches? While we're at it, why so many athletic shoes, Adidas, Converse, Nike? Is one of them wrong or is it just a matter of preference? Here's a letter by James Dobson. He sends his letters out every month. He mentions in 1994 there was a survey involving nearly 4,000 youths from 13 denominations. Josh McDowell Ministries discovered how these messages that I have mentioned earlier in the letter above have influenced the beliefs of the younger generation. Less than 10% demonstrate a consistent, cohesive belief in absolute truth. Less than 10% demonstrate a consistent, cohesive belief in absolute truth. 40% think no one can prove which religion is absolutely true. One in five thinks Christianity is nothing special. Well, I wonder why. When you have trash like this on the market, and by the way, I, you know, what I say, when I mean by trash, I'm talking specifically the Teen Study Bible. It gets worse than this. I mean, that's confusing enough. But if you look at the alternate definition, and I could not find out a reason why these alternate definitions were in there. Church, what you have to get dressed up for so you can be bored for an hour at a morning service. Why are they confused? Why are all religions the same? Well, because James Dobson in here, I've circled it, four different scriptures in here. You know what he used? The NIV each time. It's confusing when you don't have a standard. Here's guilt, conviction, right? Alternate definition, feeling like you're to blame when you didn't do anything wrong. Is that what our kids need to learn? Witnessing, alternate definition, a way to get, your, get friends to laugh at you by telling them about God. Sex, another fun thing mean adults tell teenagers to keep away from. Is that what you want your kids to learn? It's in here. It's in here. What a horrible thing to put in the minds of a young person. There are people that will pick this up and read that alternate definition and say, yeah, I, that, that's how I feel. That, that's how I feel. I feel that way. I feel My friends laugh at me when I witness to them. And they'll relate to what's in here. Oh, yeah, my, you know, it has things on there in parents, school, the whole thing. There's 20 of them. 
I'll sh I've just showed you four. Now, I told you I was going to try to create some doubt in your mind. I had a Mormon show me this. Satan desires to create doubts in your mind about God's promise of perfection. Open your Bibles to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9 tells you about Paul's trip on the road to Damascus and about his salvation experience. In Acts chapter 9 verse 6, and I'm going to jump there just to um, shorten it down. It says, And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go in the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. Now hold your place there, and look at Acts chapter 22. Acts chapter 22. In Acts chapter 22, he's retelling the story. He, it's in there three different times in the book of Acts. In Acts 22, verse 8, it says, And I answered, Who art thou, Lord? He said unto me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. And they that were with me indeed, or me, saw indeed the light and were afraid, but they heard not the voice of him that spake to me. So I ask you the question, does God's word contain errors and contradictions? Look at those two passages again, Acts 9, 7. They stood hearing a voice. And then in Acts 22, 9, but they heard not the voice of him that spake to me. Did they hear the voice or not hear the voice? When I first got saved, I was in the Air Force and I had a, uh, a, a Mormon that was my immediate supervisor. And we got into theological discussions all the time. I was, you know, I was young and dumb. I really didn't do it right, nor do I now. But I do it a lot better than I did then. But we got to talking quite a bit. Well, he showed me a book. And in there, it showed me Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 22, and said, see, those people that told you that King James Bible was perfect, they're wrong. Look at what it says right here. They heard, they, they, they were, they heard the voice, and then they didn't hear the voice. See, it's got errors in it. And I went, oh, man. I couldn't answer them. I could not answer them. I had, I had no reason to... How could I explain? That's why I tell people, and I'll tell you this, you either have God's perfect word in your hands or you don't. And if you want, if you want to believe it, then you better believe it. If you don't want to believe it, the devil will throw things up in your mind and in your life and, and try to show you that there's errors in that book. There's things in here I can't explain, but you know what I believe? I believe every word in there is the word God wants us to have. Amen. Every word. Now, I can explain this one, but what if I couldn't explain it? Should I believe it any less? See, that's the difference between faith and sight. We walk not by sight, but we walk by what? Faith. That which is not a faith is what? Sin. Without faith, it's what? Impossible to please Him. So we have to believe the Word of God by faith. It includes its perfection. We have to believe it by faith. God doesn't have to show you it's perfect. If somebody shows you a problem and you say, well, I just can't explain that, so what? People come up to me, and I've had three or four today come up to me and say, well, how do I explain this? I said, just listen tonight, and, and I'll get into this, and I'll show you this one thing, and then you go back with a different mindset. You don't have to explain it to them. You don't have to explain to everybody every, every conceived problem in the Word of God or conceived uh, um, contradiction in their mind. Now, there's some that we should study and know and be able to explain. This is one of them. In Acts 9, 4, it says, And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Notice that in verse 7 of Acts chapter 9 above, the men that were with him were standing, hearing a voice. In Acts chapter 22, look at verse 14. And he said, The God of our fathers hath chosen thee, singular, second person, that thou shouldest know his will and see that just one, and shouldest hear the voice of his mouth. Only Paul actually heard exactly what the Lord had said. 
The other men heard a voice, but they didn't hear the voice of God that spoke to Paul. Do you see the difference? If your pastor was out there and there were five other people out there with him, and I said to you, do you hear Pastor Norris out there? And you said, no, I, I hear a voice, but you couldn't recognize that it was him. You'd hear a voice, but you, you wouldn't answer me. Yes, I hear Pastor Norris if you didn't know that it was actually him. So they heard a voice, but they didn't hear the voice. Here's Acts chapter 26, verse 12, the other time that it's in your Bible. Whereupon, as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priest, at midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, notice they're on the ground, all of them, I heard a voice speaking unto me, only to Paul. And saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto all the men, to thee. Singular, second person pronoun, yanked out of the New King James Version because they say it's too hard to understand. You see, if you don't have those pronouns in there, you lose some doctrinal truth. I have appeared unto thee. Not you. I have appeared unto thee. For this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen. Singular, second person pronoun. And of those things in the which I will appear unto thee. You see, every word of God is pure. You start changing anything in this book right here, and you open yourself up to all kinds of error. Whether it be the Roman Catholic influence, the deity of Jesus Christ, salvation, the sinless... You see, all the modern translations make Jesus a sinner. All of them attack His virgin birth. All of them attack His deity. And it's over and over and over again. And it can be proven just like the salvation thing. <clears throat> Here's from James Dobson little joke he put out. We have the online Bible, the Franklin Electronic Bible, the Pentium Bible, the Video Bible, the Laser Disc Bible, and the CD-ROM Bible. King James? Never heard of it. I had somebody come up and tell me they went to a bookstore and heard, overheard them talking about selling them. They came in and said, I'd like a Bible. You know, they don't try to sell you a King James Bible. They will not sell you a King James Bible if you go in there and ask for a Bible. They'll try to talk you out of it. They'll try to talk you out of it. I had a man that got saved down at the mission. And this happened on a couple of different occasions, but one time we sent him in to get a Bible. And we said, now, you know, get a King James Bible. And he says, well, yeah, you know, he was going to do whatever we told him to do because he didn't, you know, he'd gotten saved. And we were instrumental in leading the Lord. You, you can really help those people because they, they trust you. I said, go get a King James Bible. He goes in, he gets a Bible, and he came out with a new Schofield that changed the words. And I looked at it, I said, that's not a King James Bible. Did you ask him for a King James? I asked him for a King James Bible, and they gave me this one. I said, well, let me show you. And I showed him. Now, I didn't know what was going to happen next, but that guy took that Bible and absolutely, I mean, he ripped it to shreds. Some of those guys, they, you know, they get saved. They, they hadn't, you know, put the suit and tie on yet. You know, he ripped it up. I was afraid what he was going to go back and do. He says, why would they do I said, listen. They don't understand. And boy, then I had to learn some tact. I had to calm this guy down. He was ready to kill somebody. It probably wasn't going to be me, but it was going to be somebody. <clears throat> I'm going to make Pastor Norris famous on this one. The sting of death is gone because of Calvary. Did you, did you, did you all hear him say that this morning? Remember the bee and the mom took the stinger? Remember, this is, this is what he said. And I wrote it down when he said it because I've been struggling about putting this in. This is not in my book. But I put it in here because I told Pastor Norris, I said, I, Pastor Norris, I start speaking so fast you can't even understand what his name is. <clears throat> I told him, I said, I was really in conviction because I was struggling about putting this point in there because it's not in my little booklet. The sting of death is gone because of Calvary. Do you all agree with that? How many of you agree with that? Raise your hand. Oh, man, that's a, that's a good audience. I'll tell you, about 100%. Well, you know, let me show you something. Here's Calvary, Luke 23, 33. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the male factors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. One on the right hand, the other on the left. 
The only time Calvary is found in your Bible is Luke 23, 33. The NIV, when they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. There's no Calvary in the modern translation. You see, this is serious stuff. Now let me make the plea, Pastor Norris, if you'd like to come and um, about salvation. If there is a person here that has heard all this and they're not sure of their salvation, get assured of that today. We've had people get saved in these services and, and it's exciting. And that's what it's all about. Brother? Father, please bless this invitation and speak to hearts. And Lord, if there's someone tonight that's unsaved or lost, Lord, just help them just to drop everything and come. Come to you tonight. Lord, I pray you'll bless us as a church. We ought to be concerned. We ought to be a little upset about what's happened right under our very nose. And I pray that many would come and pray and make a decision right here tonight that they are going to hold the Word of God high and they're going to do their best to keep the King James Bible in their homes and use it. And Father, maybe they lead a ministry here. I pray you'll bless them and help them to make a witness tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Now, here's the matter. As we close, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I just want you to come. God spoke to your heart. As Brother Barry leads us in the song. Would you just come here? Be right here. Make some decisions. It would be good if somebody just come and pray about this, this mess that's going on, really. If you're here and you've never trusted Christ as Savior, why don't you come meet one of our staff right now? Brother, we stand there looking for you to come. They'd like to talk to you. There may be another day. Hey, young people, maybe you want to come to life and say, hey, I'm going to stand on the, on the Bible, the King James Bible. I'm not going to be the same. This is easy enough for children to understand. They can see the things that are different levels. Maybe you want to come make a commitment about that.